out of Hebrews. Find where I'm at here. Uh, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This song and the next two songs we're going to do Um, speak about going through hard times and just praising God through the hard times and clinging to him. Um, So I'm going to encourage you to go back after church and read Hebrews 13.5 and then think back on the words that we sang here today. So please join
Well, good morning, church family. You guys sound amazing this morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Pastor Jose. If we have not had the chance to meet, I'm the associate youth pastor here. Uh, if this is your first time, your first time and a long time, on the inside of your bulletin, we have a connect card. If you uh, fill that out, drop it off in the offering box on your way out in the foyer. Just give, it a rec give us a record of your attendance uh, so we know that you are here. If you have a prayer request as well throughout the week, uh, fill it out on the back side of that and uh, drop it in the offering box so you can uh, have that re uh, request prayed for over the week. Uh, tonight at 4 o'clock we have the middle school ministry meeting. Uh, we're finishing up our series called Cheat Codes. Uh, be here for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. And then senior high at 615. We're continuing our series, The Power of the Holy Spirit's Names. It's been a good series so far. Looking forward to uh, finishing that, uh, going through with that with the senior high. Uh, the Quake Youth Conference is quickly approaching. We have spots that are starting to fill up. So if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler that would like to go, please come see me so we can get them signed up to go. Uh, the cost is $120 per student. So let's, uh, I would love for every student to attend. Uh, youth conferences are a great way to uh, bond with, uh, with each other and uh, to really get to know each other in a, in a, in a really age-appropriate setting. So I'm really looking forward to spending time with teenagers that weekend in March, March 17th to the 19th. So if you have any other questions, please come see me. If you would like to sign up your student, please come and see me as well. Uh, this Wednesday, we're back to our midweek services. Awana's meeting at 6 o'clock at the school. And FCA this week is meeting uh, at the elementary school gyms for floor hockey. Three weeks ago, I thought we were going to have some uh, broken bones and bruises. But luckily, just some slashing went on and they yeah, were fine. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. High school, so if you're, FCA, uh, if you're in high school, FCA this week at the elementary school gyms at 630. If you have a baby bottle that you took a couple weeks ago, make sure you start bringing those back filled with coins so that we can uh, get those turned in. Uh, we've uh, already swapped out some coins, and it's been going very well. So if you have a baby bottle, make sure you bring that in. And then, as always, uh, check the Facebook page for any announcements that may be coming up throughout the week as far as weather related or uh, services or anything like that. I have one more announcement and I'm going to have Pastor Wayne come up and kind of walk us through something. We had a little issue with last week so I'm going to have Pastor Wayne come up and share this. Well, like Pastor Jose said, um, issue, yeah, I started trash talking last uh, Sunday. Um, <laughs> about football, and I said that I might have to apologize. Well, if you watch the games, you know why I have to apologize. But Pastor Steve, who has um, um, recently just uh, moved part-time temporarily to Kansas, um, Kansas City, he um, texted me this week because um, he watched our service online. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was very serious. He said, you know, I watched the announcements, and you guys were promoting the Super Bowl party uh, that's coming up here uh, next week. And he said, I know a few years ago, it was illegal to call it a Super Bowl party. That, that, that name is um, trademarked by the NFL. And so he said, I don't want to have you guys get in trouble or anything. So he had a suggestion. Instead of calling the youth activity that we're going to be having here at the church next Sunday the Super Bowl party, he suggested calling it the almost annual Chiefs game. <laughs> he said that would uh, keep us from any you know, copyright uh, problems and it would keep me out of jail. So I appreciate Pastor Steve looking out for my best interests there. Um, as far as other announcements, I had a few other announcements that Jose uh, wasn't going to make, but uh, they're involving small groups. And last Sunday we talked about a new small group starting here at the church on Sunday evenings. Tonight will be their second time together, and they're going through this book by Amir Sarfati called The Day Approaching. It has a study guide that goes along with it. Even if you're not interested in coming or you're not able to come to the small group that meets here at 6 o'clock on Sunday evenings, uh, but you would like a copy of these books, I've ordered some additional ones. They gave out all the ones that I had last week. But um, 
We ordered some more, so there will be some coming in. This is uh, apparently an awesome book about the end times and how to know what's going to be coming uh, so that you're prepared for the soon return of the Lord. And then another small group that's also in the wings getting ready to start is uh, going to be hosted by Levi and Jenna Olson on the attributes of God by Stephen Lawson. And if you're interested in that, there is a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center out in the lobby. So sign up there. I think it's going to be meeting on Monday evenings. Uh, not sure about a location yet, whether it's going to be at their home or here at the church. But if you're interested in being a part of a small group that's not already meeting, getting ready to start on Monday evenings, please sign up out there. And there's also a sign-up for this uh, evening's Bible study as well. So. so, yeah, as the worship team comes back up to lead us in worship, yeah, the Super Bowl party next week. It's open to everybody. It's going to be here. We're going to have a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. So come on out next week at 5 o'clock. Worship team. So that verse that I read from Hebrews earlier was a direct pull from the Old Testament by Paul. And it was from Deuteronomy 31, 6, when Moses was speaking to the God's people, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And this next song, Almost Home, was um, penned by Bart Millard. It's a fun name, but that's his name. Um, and he penned it after his youth pastor, who at that time had grown old and he was into his 70s, and he was expressing to Millard that when he got into ministry, when he got into church, he was ready for the short game. He was excited to work with teens and do the youth ministry, and you know he could take things in stride in the short game. And he said, I'm just tired. He said, I've, I've run the long game of ministry. He said, I've buried friends. I've done funerals for family members and friends, and I'm just tired. He said, I'm worn. So Millard wrote this song as a kind of a, a battle cry, kind of put your foot in the dirt and plant yourself and look up to God and say, thank you for never forsaking me. Be with me as we go through this, or as I go through this, or as you go through this. So as we sing through this song, I would encourage you to stay seated, um, but sing along as you can and just listen to the words and let them soak in.
amazing when we get to heaven and we get to cry holy, holy, holy when we go home. Please be seated. I was in my early 40s with a lot of life before me when a moment came that stopped me on a dime. I spent most of the next days looking at the x-rays, talking about the options and talking about sweet time. I asked him when it sank in that this might really be the real end. How's it hit you when you get that kind of news? Man, what you do? And he said, I went skydiving, I went rocky mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Blue Manchu. And I looked deeper and I spoke sweeter and I gave forgiveness. I Denying. And he said, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. He said, I was finally the husband, and most of the time I wasn't. I became a friend a friend would like to have And all of a sudden going fishing Wasn't such an imposition And I went three times that year I lost my dad Well, I, I finally read the good book And I took a good long hard look At what I'd do if I could do it all again I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Blue Manchu. And I looked deeper and I spoke sweeter and I gave forgiveness I've been denying. And he said, someday I His name is Samuel Timothy Smith, or at least that's what he was called in his childhood. We know him today as Tim McGraw. His father was Tug McGraw, a Major League Baseball pitcher who played for the 
New York Mets and the Philadelphia Phillies. Once in his early career, Tug was in the minor leagues in Jacksonville, Florida. And he met a lady by the name, an 18-year-old girl by the name of Betty D'Agostino and started what became a Bull Durham kind of romance and Betty became pregnant and uh, Tug didn't know about it. He eventually left and went up to the majors and Betty's parents sent her to Louisiana to live with relatives where the baby was born. And then when Tim was seven months old, she married a man named Horace Smith and she told Tim that Horace was his father. And uh, Betty and Horace divorced when Tim was in the fourth grade. But when he was 11 years old, he was rummaging through his mother's closet, I think looking for some Christmas presents. Any kids ever done that? <laughs> he came across his birth certificate. And he was confused because on his birth certificate, his last name wasn't Smith, it was McGraw. And so he asked his mother about it, and she told him that he was conceived in Florida by a Major League Baseball player named Tug McGraw. And interestingly, Tim had a baseball card collection, and even though he didn't know Tug was his father, he had Tug McGraw's baseball card in his collection. So his mom took him to meet Tug, and Tug denied that Tim was his son and that he was his father's. And for several years, Tim sent letters to his father, Tug, which were unanswered. And finally, Tim got frustrated and fed up and just didn't want anything else to do with his biological father. And there was a time when he and his mother were dirt poor. And it was right before Tim went off to college. And so he once again contacted his father, Tug, and said, could you help me out with some college tuition? And uh, Tug said, I will do it on one condition, that you and Betty no longer contact me ever again. And he said, well, I, we'll do that, but I want to meet you one last time. And so when they met together one last time, or supposedly one last time, Tug realized that at that age, his son, Tim, looked just like him. And so they started a relationship, and they finally forged a father-son relationship, Tim and his father, Tug. 2004, Tug died of brain cancer, and that's the same year that Tim McGraw released this wildly popular album, Live Like You Were Dying. He said it wasn't really a tribute to his father, Tug, but he shared that it helped him deal with his father's tragic death. To live like you were dying. You know, the truth is we are all dying. So the real question becomes, will we live before we die? That's what Solomon is unpacking for us in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. God does not want us just to endure this life. He's designed us to live, to really live. Jesus summed up his mission on this earth with these famous words from John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's what this passage we're going to look today is all about, how to really live. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Solomon hits again on this continual theme that he's been talking about here in Ecclesiastes. That's the theme of death. And essentially he says that if you knew the day of your death, it would change your life. It would change the way you live your life. If we knew when our life would be over, we would be carefully spending every moment that we have up until that point. We'd be more careful about our relationships. We'd be more careful about our money. We'd be careful about the way we work, about our friendships. We would enjoy life rather than just endure it. It would change the way that we do things, I believe. But because we're unaware of that day, the day of our death, we tend to live our days as if they were infinite. We'll just continue on living and live forever. At least that's how the way 
that we live. As a result, we become careless in our relationships, careless with our time, careless with our money, careless with our work, and ultimately, I believe we become careless with God. Great tragedy is that Solomon lived exactly like that. Instead of living like he was dying, he blew it. Burned out now, he's old, he's a perverted genius who wasn't very smart. He's reflecting back on all of his days, and and I believe he would say in everyday vernacular, boy, did I ever blow it. I should have trusted the Lord, I should have done what he said, I've lived now, and I have great regrets. While God forgives me and things are redeemed, it would have been so much better if I'd have lived my life differently. And I believe what he's doing here in the book of Ecclesiastes is he's admonishing us to get a grip on life. We've talked about how life is meaningless, how it's vapor, it's smoke, it's here for a little while, and then it vanishes away, and there's not much in life that brings satisfaction. But here we see that even though Solomon lived like that, he's admonishing us to take inventory, to take account of our lives, to live our life differently. Look with me at verse 1 of chapter 9. He says, for I considered all that is in my heart so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. Solomon's, I believe, turning the corner now in his search for meaning to life, and he's coming to terms with reality. And up until now, chapter after dark chapter, His journal has been devoted to an expose of emptiness. In effect, he's saying, I've tried all these things, and they don't satisfy. And allow me to save you the time. Allow me to save you the effort and the energy and the waste of your life by pursuing after those things, because I've tried it all, and it's failed. Come up empty. I know, because I've been there. I've done that. And then he presents in this chapter some realities that give life, I believe, definition and meaning. And I want it this morning in our time together to just share with you four of those realities as they are stated or rather implied in this passage. And the first one, if you're taking notes, is this. We can enjoy life because God is in control. We can enjoy life because God is in control. Stress and anxiety come from not being in control. You know that's why people get stressed before they go into surgery? They experience stress about the surgery because they're out of control and they realize, I'm not in control. Somebody else is in control. They don't have options. That's why people get anxious about sometimes flying in an airplane. They realize that they're putting their life in someone else's hands out of control. Sometimes the way people feel about rush hour traffic. Now, we don't have a lot of rush hour traffic. I guess maybe when Marvin's shifts gets off and people crowd the, uh, the town. But you've probably been in bigger cities with rush hour traffic. And people get really frustrated and upset because they're not in control. They wish everybody would just learn to drive the right way. You know, and hence we have what's known as road rage. People get stressed when they're not in control. But we know who is in control. Solomon says all of this is in the hand of God. Sometimes people who are outside the church think that just because I'm a preacher that sometimes I have it in with God. And and they'll, they'll come up to me sometimes and they'll say things like, you know, especially days when we're having really bad weather, and they'll say, can't you do something about this? I don't even really know how to respond to people like that. I mean, what do you, what do you say? Uh, maybe I should say something like, well, I'm in sales, not management. <laughs> God is in control. God controls the weather. God controls all. I'm not in, you know, because I'm a preacher in specifically with God. He's in control. Only God knows what tomorrow holds. Only God knows what's good and bad. And as Solomon put it here, whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. 
We tend to make categorical judgments based upon a very limited information that we have. For example, from our perspective, as we read the Bible, Joseph suffered horribly when God allowed his brothers to sell him into slavery. Why would God allow that? Why would God allow Joseph, young boy, 17 years old, to be sold into slavery and then tell his dad that he had died at the hands of a wild animal? Yet God used that entire thing in Joseph's life to save an entire nation. Joseph later said this, that it was all in the hands of God. Or we see bad things happening to people. And like Job and his friends, we we join into their, if we don't say it, we think it. Maybe these bad things are happening in people's lives because they are far away from God. If they were just closer to God in their relationship, bad stuff wouldn't happen to them. Well, God used Job's suffering to bring glory to himself, to demonstrate to Satan that Job loved him and worshipped him, not because God had blessed him. Because even when God allowed it all to be taken away, Job still praised God. And I think this should be freeing for us. So freeing, because even when we go through the darkest times, we, we are in the hand of the Father. We can trust Him. In fact, Francis Schaeffer, a Christian philosopher and author, said this, God is there and He is not silent. What reassurance that should bring us. It should tell us, among other things, that nothing is out of control. Neither are we useless, despairing robots, stumbling awkwardly through time and space, facing a bleak future in the end. Our problem is this, though. We don't get messages from God. He's not on instant messenger telling us everything's going to be okay. We don't get instant tweets from heaven that it's all right. Just hang on. So we just have to trust that God is in control and live our lives like that is true. See, the Bible never promises us that we will only know good health and good times and prosperity. And yet, even though there are some contemporary Christian preachers out there that are saying, hey, if you just trust God, everything's going to be okay in your life. You know, the health and wealth philosophy of prosperity gospel, it's heresy. The Bible never promises us that. Sometimes being in the hand of God is not a synonymous guarantee for safety, economic prosperity, physical health, or painless life, or enjoying some trouble-free occupation, or having everybody smile and like you. You know, I'm reminded of those three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I would rather be with them in the fire with the Son of God with me than be like Nebuchadnezzar outside the fire looking in. Biblical faith is not about control or manipulation of God so that He will do what we want. Biblical faith is that radical abandonment of self, of our whole being, and grateful trust and love in a God who has disclosed to us through His life, death, and resurrection in Jesus Christ that things are going to work out. Ultimately in the end. Maybe not in this life, but in the end. You and I are not in control. But I can enjoy the trip because the pilot is my Heavenly Father. And my life is in His hands. But secondly, the only way to be prepared to live is to first be prepared to die. Look at verse 2. All things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good, the clean, and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath as he who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. That one thing happens to all. Truly, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Steve Jobs, the late founder of Apple, said, When I was 17... I read a quote that went something like this. If you live each day 
as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. He said, it made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and I've asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know something needs to change. Death is one of those subjects, though, that we don't like to discuss. We're hesitant to even come to grips with our own impending death and would rather avoid any discussion of it. It's not casual dinner conversation or coffee tail conversation when you have people over. Oh, let's talk about death today. It doesn't happen. It's a depressing subject, and who wants to be depressed? Then all around us, we have religious hucksters who are whispering in our ears some sentimentalized, superstitious view of death to inoculate us against the moral shock of death and to make it a pleasant transition into another world. Oh, it's just another blessed thing that happens. Solomon strips away all that sentimental view and death is just a transition into another state of blessedness. No, he says there is no eternal blessedness for the man who does not know blessedness now. You only know blessedness now if you're living in a saving faith relationship with a God of providence. We are not prepared to, to live until we are prepared to die. And over and over again, as we've seen throughout this book already, the first eight chapters, that Solomon's using this phrase, under the sun, under the sun, meaning events that are happening here on this earth. Not taking into effect what happens in eternity, but just what happens here. When it comes to death, Solomon could summarize verses 2 and 3 with just a few words. Under the sun, you're done. That's in essence what he's saying. doesn't matter whether you're good or bad, a sinner or not a sinner. Whether you're a saint or somebody somebody looks up to. Death happens to all of us. You know, and... That's our ultimate destiny, no matter what you do. And I'm not trying to say don't do things to take care of yourself, but if you take vitamins and you drink the right kind of water and you work out and you stay away from McDonald's and other fast food restaurants and don't make too many trips to Krispy Kreme donuts, you know that, oh, I'm going to live a better life. Well, yeah, your life might be better. But even the best care for this body will one day give out and it will die. That's the assurance we have in scriptures. For it's appointed unto man once to die. All men. Verse 3 says that death is labeled the evil. The Bible calls it the last enemy. Death is not natural. Listen, death's not natural. It's not this circle of life. It's a dead end and it's death. Death is I guess some of the dumbest advice we could give someone is to say that death is just a part of life. No, it isn't. It's death. Not life. It's death. It's the cost of our sin and rebellion against God. And it's cosmic treason where we are co-conspirators and it's punishable by death. Sin and rebellion against God. The punishment is death. For the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And the reality is we weren't created for death. We were created for life. To be a living people with a living God who will live forever with this living God. And the only way to get rid of death is to get rid of sin. That's why Jesus' death on the cross is so important. Because He did just that. He died in our place because of our sin. He paid the penalty and today, if you will believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior from your sin, He offers you eternal and abundant life. No one's prepared to live unless they are prepared to die. Everybody dies. And how you view death will absolutely control how you live life. If you believe that there's no God, and there's no judgment, and there's no heaven nor hell, you'll live in light of that. But if you believe that there is a God and a heaven and that there's life to come, it will change 
the way you live your life. Most people, I believe, live as if they were not even, that weren't, weren't even a possibility for them. Just reckless sexuality, debauchery, food, alcohol, and drugs. Don't wear a helmet. Don't buckle up. Live forever, and then you die. That's madness, Solomon says. Madness, as he refers to there in verse 3, is the denial of God's penalty for death. It's the madness that humbled its, or rather not humbled, but thumbed its nose at God the Creator in the garden that said, hey, we can know good and evil. We just partake of this fruit. We'll be like God. It's madness of evil which God judged with the flood in Noah's day. It's total madness of sexual insanity or homicidal insanity or even materialistic madness. It's the craziness that talks about God and yet lives for the devil. Because the Bible says we are all going to die. And once you know God, you know what awaits you in God. Death changes then. When you have a relationship with God, death is not something to be feared. It becomes like 1 Corinthians 15 says, all of a sudden it's a gift that God gives us. Because we're liberated from a life of sin and death and folly. And we're instead exchanging that for eternal joy. And we get to see God face to face. That's what Solomon's point is here. The only way you are prepared to live is if you are first prepared to die. But three... Third thing here is that while there is life, there is hope. Look at verse 4. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. You know, the particular word, Hebrew word here for hope is only used one other time in the scriptures and it's in 2 Kings chapter 19 or chapter 18 and verse 19. And it's not something that we're looking forward to something or wishing for something to happen like I hope I win the lottery. I don't even play the lottery so I can't win it. But you know what I mean? We, we have this, this hope that I hope something good happens in the future. I, I hope maybe it warms up this week. Might not, but I hope it does. Rather, this word speaks of certainty that one has that something will happen. Solomon, in spite of all the things that he's seen and lived through, is, I believe, unapologetically pro-life. And to make his point, he quotes this proverb. He says, a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now, what is he saying here? Well, I think he's saying, would you rather be a dog or would you rather be a lion? Now, if we were to ask that question, would you rather be a dog or would you rather be a cat? Most of people, unless you're the cat lady that has a half dozen or more cats, you would say, I'd rather be the dog. Because when you compare a dog and a cat, a dog is so loving, he's compassionate, he's loyal, he's always there, he doesn't care what you do. You know, cats aren't like that. So if you were to ask people, would you rather be a cat or a dog, they would say, I'd rather be a dog. Unless you're comparing a dog to a lion. Now, that's a big cat. A lion is so much better than a dog. People would rather be the lion than the dog. So he's saying here, which would you rather be, a dog or a, a lion? And people would say, well, I'd rather be the dog. But we understand, listen, we, we love dogs. We, we make dogs our pets. And how many of you have dogs? Yeah, dog people, right? You love dogs. You use them for hunting. They're nice companions. They're cute. They're fun. But that was not the case in biblical times. You got to understand, in biblical times, the metaphor of a dog was an insult. When, it used, when they described people as dogs, that was an insult. It wasn't some cute, furry, cuddly thing that we, is always waiting for us, you know, when we get home from work to just... <laughs> That's not what they were. They were repulsive creatures. Remember when David went out to fight Goliath? 
He had nothing in his hands but a slingshot. And this giant Goliath, this warrior, felt greatly insulted. And he said in 1 Samuel 17, 43, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Who is this little twerp? What do you think I am, a dog? Kind of like the same way we would think today about rats. Oh, I hate rats. Or, or, or possums. Now, I understand some people eat possums. It's a repulsive creature. That's the way they viewed dogs. So if you wrap your mind around that, would you rather be a dog or a lion? Well, everybody would say, I'd rather be the lion, right? Not the dog, because the dog is wretched, repulsive. A lion was considered a great and noble animal, even in biblical times. The book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 30, 30 says, The lion is mighty among beasts and does not retreat before any. And in the book of Revelations, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. In chapter 5 and verse 5. So Solomon's proverbial comment that a live dog is better than a dead lion means that even the most contemptible, miserable person who's alive is better off than the greatest, most admired person who's dead. Another way of saying this is a homeless guy alive is better off than Warren Buffett dead. Life then, no matter how miserable, is to be preferred over death. Because the dead see nothing, feel nothing, hear nothing, say nothing, and do nothing. They vanish from the earth and no longer a part of its activities. At some point you will die. And people, listen, I know this is hard to hear. But you will die and I will die and people will forget us. We would love for our family and friends and relatives to get together every year after we're gone and to have a party and remember us. But that won't happen. We're forgotten. All the stuff that we hang on to, all the petty stuff that we get angry and jealous about, when we die, that's forgotten. Maybe not immediately, but ultimately. It's forgotten. So the memory of all that stuff is going to fade. And I think that needs to sober us up. And we need to ask, what am I doing with my time? What am I doing with my days? What am I doing with my emotions? People that I say that I hate or I can't stand or I don't like being around. All that's going to be forgotten when you're gone. So you're going to spend all your energy while you only have a few short days on this earth Hating people? Is it really a good investment of your time? Or you might say, well, I'm not a hater. I'm a lover. I love, I love, I love. Well, is that person that you say you love worth loving? Have you committed yourself to a relationship that you know is a bad investment? Solomon is in essence saying, is it worth it? Is it worth it? You know, there are people, I believe, that are maybe even here today that are bitter haven't spoke to friends or family in a long time and is that really how you want to spend the little bit of time that you have is it worth it is it a good investment it's not you're going to die and you're going to stand before god and you're going to give an account and nobody's going to remember that you were ever born all those piddly petty little stupid foolish stuff that you waste all your time and energy on doesn't even matter that's life a bad plan it's a terrible plan but you're still alive don't waste it so solomon gives us a better plan and it's number four in your outline it's not enough to just live god wants us to really live look at verse seven go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for god has already accepted your works let your garments always be white and let your head lack no oil Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life which he has given under you under the sun. All your days of vanity. For that is your portion in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. 
So I believe most Christians wonder what God's will is. Do you know what God's will is? Enjoy life. Enjoy the gift that I've given you. That, that word there in verse 7, go, this is probably like the, the fifth time that he's told us to eat, to drink, to you know, seize the day. But this word, go, is a command. All the other instances where we see it in the book of Ecclesiastes is, ah, there's nothing better than to eat and drink and be merry. Kind of like a suggestion. He's not suggesting it now. He's saying, I command you, go, eat, drink, live your life. You've only got a few short days. So how are we to live? Well, he gives us four different things here. Enjoy your meals. Bread and wine was a basic meal. Kind of like meat and potatoes. Not lobster or prime rib. It's just the basic, simple meal. Simple things of life. I think many of us just wolf down our food. And even with fast food, we just try to get it faster, right? Hardly even taste it. God has given us that food. We need to stop and slow down and enjoy it. That's why it's important sometimes to just, even before you eat, to pray. To thank God that He's given you something to eat. To enjoy the gift. I think what helps is having meal times. You know, that's something we've gotten away from. I was talking to my wife a little bit about that the other day. We've gotten away from the family gathering around the dinner table. We eat on the run or we grab our meals and we go and we sit and watch TV or a movie or something. We don't really have conversation. We don't really encourage one another around the dinner table. Now, we've been watching this uh, series on TV. You've probably heard of it, Blue Bloods. Sometime during the show, the family always gets together at the dinner table and talks about life. That doesn't happen much anymore. Have meal time together. Create conversation. Share memories. It's a good time for affirmation and encouragement and laughter. So enjoy your meals. Secondly, enjoy your celebrations. Let your garments always be white. Let your head lack no oil. That's a Hebrew phrase for party. Have a good time. White garments were for celebrations. There are times we need to get all dressed up. But white and the white garments of those days speak about comfort. In, in the hot climate, light colored clothing was cooler. Fragrant oil was used for hospitality. Learn to celebrate. Celebrate things that happen. Birthdays, anniversaries, special occasions. Live life with celebration. Thirdly, he says, enjoy your marriage. Look at verse 9 again. He says, rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your... I'm reading the wrong chapter. I'm like, whoa. did not sound like what I was saying. Verse 9, live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life which he has given you under the sun. Joy your marriage. Marriage is to be enjoyed, not endured. Far too many couples, and, and I know, most couples, they have not really big fights. They just fuss and pick at each other. It's like a dripping faucet. It just drives you crazy, right? And that's the way we treat each other. Stop it. Start offering one another praise. Be kind to one another. Do things for each other. Marriage is a gift that God has given us to enjoy. You know, I've never met anyone who enjoyed spending time with their spouse in marriage who later regretted it. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Wasted time. No. Be a blessing to one another. Have fun. Laugh together. Keep the romance alive. Be enjoyable and you'll enjoy your marriage. And if you have an enjoyable marriage, count your blessings. And if you don't, fix it. Or at least fix your part in it. 
God can give you the grace to make your marriage enjoyable. But fourthly, enjoy your work. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. God doesn't want us to live for the weekend because we're finally off of work and, oh, we dread Mondays. Some of you will probably say, well, you don't understand. I hate my job. Then quit. Well, I can't afford to quit. Really? Then think of it as a gift that God has given you that you get to work and enjoy the work that you do. Change your attitude towards your job. Change your attitude towards your work. Appreciate it. Work enthusiastically. Enjoy work. Because when we enjoy the gift that God has given us, it honors the one who gave it. We honor the giver. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Are you just doing your job to please your boss or your supervisor? Or are you doing it to please the Lord? Where you or I work doesn't really make a difference. Work is a privilege that we'll not have after we die. Listen, we will serve the Lord, but I don't think it's going to be the same way that we do today because we live under the curse today. There will be active service in heaven, but it won't be work as we know it now. And if your work is a curse, then spend some time talking with someone who's not been able to work and ask them if they would rather have your job. It's a blessing. I think sometimes many Christians live their life as if it's a sin to enjoy life. But yet God created men and women to live in a place called Eden. You know what Eden means in Hebrew? Delight. To live in delight. And the Bible teaches us that one day, once again on this earth, there will be Eden-like qualities. We're created to live that way. So we prepare now, while we're here, for what's to come in eternity. Hebrew, Hebrew people knew a little bit about joy. And in fact, they perhaps knew it better than any other culture of people. In the Old Testament alone, there are no less than 10 different words for joy. They understood joy. So let me ask you, what's your level of joy? Are you enjoying the gifts that God has given you? Will you live before you die? Enjoyment comes from living at 100% with the blessings that God has given us. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And to make it more emphasis, he says, Again, I will say, rejoice. The key there in that verse is that prepositional phrase, in the Lord. It's difficult to enjoy this life and to see it as a gift from God if you don't know the Creator, if you don't know the Giver, if you don't know the Promised One, the Prince of Life. If you're miserable in this life, maybe it's because you're not ready for the next one. You can't live like you have real life if you don't. So God wants us to enjoy this life, not despite the brevity or the unpredictability of life, but because of it. So how do we do this? How can we live so that even though life is brief and unpredictable, we can find joy in this life? Well, in the beginning, God created the world so that we would love Him and enjoy Him all the days of our life, forever. But then sin entered the world and destroyed all this and Jesus has come and has died and he's risen again to save us from this enslavement that we have to sin so that we can live life as he's intended it to be. And if you know him as your personal savior, that's something we look forward to with hope. We hope in the resurrection of the dead and life eternal with him forever and ever and ever. When we see that life is a gift that God has given us, we enjoy the gift. When we see that life is brief, but that God has granted us eternal life through those who have accepted Christ's gift, we'll understand that death is not the end. So we live like we're dying. Because we are. By God's grace, and especially because of what Jesus has done, that's exactly what we must decide to do. To live like we are dying. Let's pray. Father, once again, I thank you and I praise you for the privilege you've given me to open your word and to speak the truth. 
that Solomon shares with us. Lord, someone that's been down the road before us, seen the heartache, the misery that life brings, and yet, he says, in light of death, we're to live life. Really live life. Because it's all in your hands. You're in control. And you want us to enjoy the gift that you've given us. So God, I pray that you would help us to change our attitudes towards life. To live life. To really live an abundant life. And Lord, if there would be those here today that have never placed their faith and trust in you, that don't really know what it means to live abundantly, I pray that today that would change. That they would accept and trust you as their own personal Savior. And start living like they were dying. We'll be careful to thank you and praise you for all this we ask in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song. Parents, you are dismissed to pick up your kids from Children's Church.
forth, live like you're dying.